Let's bow our heads and look to God in prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for creating this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Lord, for uniting us together, uniting your church together to worship you. And Father, here we are to, to give thanks to you for being a faithful God. Here we are, O oh God, as your sheep, asking you, our Good Shepherd, to continue to watch over us and to care for us. Here we are, Lord Jesus, even as, even as the world hates us because we bear your name, because we live according to your standards. Here we are, O oh Lord Jesus asking for your grace to sustain us. So Lord, as our heads are bowed, we pray that, Master, that you take charge over your church. We are yours. Help us and bless us to be a blessing. Dear God, we pray and commit all of us over here into your hands. You know, you know very well, O oh God, what each one of us is going through the struggles that we face, the challenges uh, that we have. Master, may your, may your grace be sufficient. May you be enough for us, O oh Lord. Dear Lord, we, we continue to ask and pray that you would bless us and that you would continue to bless your church. And Lord, that your purposes your purposes for establishing a church in this place, your purposes for keeping this church alive for so many years, may that be fulfilled, O God, in and through us. Use us as your instruments. Use us as your light. Use us as your salt in this place. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for the privilege, O oh God, to have brothers and sisters in Christ so that we are not alone. We thank you most importantly for your presence in our lives. We also want to thank you, dear God, that you've given us one another to encourage, to challenge us in this walk of life. Correct us when we are wrong. And so, dear Lord, we, uh, we thank you for our brother and sister sheep here with us. We pray, dear God, that you would use us in each other's lives. That we may not stray away from your fold. Lord God, we pray in a special way and come at Lord, those amongst us who are struggling with sickness and particular, dear God, we just lift up to your throne of grace, Barbara Royer, even as she is in hospice care at the Masonic Village, we lift her up to you, O oh God, that you would, that you'd be with her at this time. We thank you for the privilege that some of us could go and just uh, worship you along with her and the family. Lord, we just pray for her, we pray for Jim and for the daughters and the other family members that you would continue to strengthen them as they go through this time, O oh Lord. Uh, we want to pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd uh, continue to bless our church, that you'd bless the leaders of our church, the leaders of our denomination, that you'd continue to grant us wisdom, that you'd help us, O oh Lord, to hold on to your word, and uh, Master, that you would guide us in our decision-making, that it would be to edify your church, O oh God. Gracious Lord, we uh, pray and commit our nation into your hands. We pray and ask you that you'd be with this nation, O oh God, and that you'd guide the nation, especially, O oh God, for the very important choices that they need to make uh, to choose their leader. We pray that people wouldn't be distracted uh, by lies or 
by anything else oh god uh but that you would you would grant them discernment to oh god uh to elect the people of your choice and lord no matter who comes to power we thank you lord jesus that you are still on the throne that you still rule and uh, we pray and ask you that your plans and purposes for this nation would be fulfilled oh god we pray and ask you for your peace in uh, war torn situations where there is turmoil and conflict especially oh god we uh, pray for the situation between russia and ukraine between israel and her uh, lord neighbors we just ask and pray lord jesus that that your peace and your purposes would prevail Gracious Lord we ask and pray for discernment also at this time when uh Lord when things come that we are not aware of sickness and disease that has never been heard of uh or choices that we need to make and what we need uh to even in Lord even the choices that we need to make over our food yeah uh, or everything else we we just pray oh Lord that you'd help us and guide us oh master dear god we pray for our brothers and sister all throughout the world in churches all across the world oh god we pray that you'd continue to bless them bless the ministry of your word oh god and may your churches be healthy may your churches be strong deep rooted on your word oh god Lord we pray for our persecuted Christian brothers and sisters we pray and commit them to your care oh god that you'd help them to continue to hold on strongly to you oh jesus you know you know that we christians are a easy target as we live according to your word that tells us to love our enemies as we live according to your word that says to not uh not to not take revenge but to give that in your hands leave that in your hands to bless those who even curse us lord as we live according to your standards and lord even as your church is being persecuted we pray and ask you that you would strengthen and that you would help o oh god help that the faith of your sheep would be strengthened as they go through the fire of persecution and lord we pray that lord jesus even as you are the one who transforms persecuting souls into proclaiming pauls that you do that in the lives of the persecutors too. Oh Jesus, we pray and commit our future into your hands. We do not know, God, what will happen in the next second, in the next minute or the uh, next day, next week or years. But you do, O oh Lord. And so we hold on to you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you. help our faith not to be shaken oh god grant us your grace and your mercy and lord even as we look into your word now we pray that you'd encourage us that you'd bless us and that you'd strengthen us feed us from your word oh lord jesus and strengthen your sheep for we ask this in jesus most precious name amen Well, let's uh let's do our memory verse for the for the month from Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 Joshua 1:8 let's all say this together This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it 
for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Joshua 1, 8. Let's say that one more time. That's this is the last time that we'll be saying it in the church. Uh, so let's, let's try and memorize it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Joshua 1, 8. Anne Graham Lotz, she tells about a, a high school assembly that was filled with students who had gathered to hear a recruiting pitch from, uh, from representatives of the four branches of the armed forces. Each officer of those four branches of the armed forces, they were given 10 minutes to tell the students why they should sign up for their branch of service. Okay, so 10 minutes, they had to give their, make their pitch to make their students choose, you know, sign up for their branch of service. So the Air Force captain, he spoke first, and he got a little carried away with the virtues of the Air Force. So instead of 10 minutes, he took 18 minutes telling the students why they should join the Air Force. Not to be outdone, the Army Sergeant, he followed, and he took 19 minutes in his recruiting pitch. Now, the Navy officer who came next, he was still a little upset that the Navy had lost to the Army in a recent football game, and so the Navy officer he spoke for 20 minutes. By this time, the frustrated school counselor, she leaned over and she told the Marine Major that he had only three minutes to speak. And so this Marine Major, he stood up in front of all the students and he didn't say a word. As he let his gaze go up and down each row, as he carefully examined the young students in front of him. And then finally, he broke the silence with a brief challenge. He said, the Marines are looking for a few good men and women. I'm not sure I see any over here. But if you think you are one, Meet me in the gym after this assembly. After the assembly, the Marine Major was swamped with volunteers. He was swamped with volunteers. It seems people want a challenge. And when they meet this challenge head on, it seems that you know, people get more fulfillment. This morning, let me also make a recruiting pitch, but in less than 15 seconds, okay? So here's my pitch. Jesus is looking for a few good men and women to become his followers. And I'm not sure I see any over here. I doubt whether even two or three of you in this room could even cut it as Jesus' followers. But if you think you are one, meet me after the service in the Grace Cafe. Now, how many of you were challenged by that? How many of you were offended by what I said? How many of you want to say, how rude. How many of you just want to get up and leave the church after hearing that? Well, this morning, as we continue in our study of the last chapter of the book of Joshua, 
we are going to hear Joshua say something very shocking and very offensive to our modern ears. Now, if you remember last Sunday, we saw, we saw how Joshua, uh, we saw in Joshua chapter 24, how Joshua called everyone, all the Israelites, to a place called Shechem. And he reminded the people about the grace of God. That in God's grace, he had chosen them as a nation. He had protected them. He had provided for them. He had blessed them. Not only in the past, but he was also doing it in the present. And in the present, and God would continue to be gracious and help them even in the future. And so because they had, because they were, and because they will experience God's abundant grace, the people had to make a choice and a firm commitment to serve God alone. Let's begin reading from Joshua chapter 24, and we'll read verses 14 to 28. If you have your Bibles, please follow along with me. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 28. Joshua 24, 14, following. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods, of your, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive you your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn And do you harm and consume you after having done you good? And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. This is the word of the Lord. So last Sunday, we ended with those very famous words of Joshua. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And uh, last Sunday, many of us also prayed that same prayer individually or joining hands as a family. We prayed, we will serve the Lord. You remember that, right? That was wonderful on Sunday. But how many of us continue to pray that on Monday? 
and on the other days of the week? How many of us continue to pray that individually or joining hands together as a couple or together as a family, even at home, throughout the week? How many of us did that? Why do we need to do that? I mean, we don't need to do all that outside this church building, right? God is only inside over here. God only watches and is interested in what we do and what we say over here, right? Why do we need to do it outside? And dear brothers and sisters, the promises that we make in words in here, the promises that we make in words in here need to be lived out and witnessed by God and the people outside. And we also need to realize that we cannot, that we cannot keep those promises that we make in our own strength simply by you know, determining to do so. We cannot keep those promises in our own strength. We need God's grace and help constantly. So how many of us will continue to pray individually and as a family? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, I hope that we all do that every day. So Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In front of the people, he boldly proclaims, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What did the people say? How did the people respond? Now, I mean, we know, we read how they responded, but they did not respond exactly like Joshua. The people did not say, yes, Joshua, as for me and my house, we will also serve the Lord like you. The people's response is not a public, personal, passionate, and purposeful declaration like Joshua's. Look at what they say in verses 16 through 18. Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us up uh, and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He did those great signs in our sight. He preserved us, you know, wherever we passed. He drove out before us all the people did you hear what the people said? You, you heard what the people said. The people were not sleeping when Joshua was preaching. Just in case if some of you are. The people were not sleeping. They were, they were listening carefully to Joshua. And they remembered and they repeated everything that God said through Joshua. And what they are saying over there, when Joshua says... Because of all of this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What they are saying over there, far be it from us. They are saying, goodness gracious. How can we forsake the Lord and serve other gods when the Lord has brought us over here to the promised land? How can we forsake the Lord and serve other gods when the Lord has delivered us and our fathers from slavery in Egypt. How can we forsake the Lord and serve other gods when we have witnessed with our own eyes the Lord's great signs for us? How can we forsake the Lord and serve other gods when it is the Lord who has preserved us everywhere that we've gone? How can we forsake the Lord and serve other gods when it is the Lord who has driven out all our enemies, how can we forsake him? Therefore, therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. You see, the people, they agree with Joshua that God has indeed done all of this, what he has said for us. And so we will serve him. But 
if, if you read closely, the people forgot one important thing that Joshua told them to do before they chose to serve God alone. They forgot one important thing. Joshua said, put away the gods. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt. Put away the gods and serve the Lord. Did the people say or do anything about what Joshua had specifically asked for? Did, did they say or do anything about the gods? And Joshua specifically told them to put away. Let me compare what these people do, I mean, did not do to an incident that takes place in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. You know, in Acts chapter 19, when the apostle Paul, when he went and he preached the gospel in the city of Ephesus, this is what happens. Acts chapter 19, verse 17 onwards. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also many of those who are now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Did you see that? Some of those who believed in Jesus now, they, they, they burned everything. And what was the value of the thing that they burned? 50,000 pieces of silver. That is equal to the yearly wages, the annual wages of 150 men at that time. It was that precious. When these people in, Eph in Ephesus, when they believed in Jesus as their Lord, as their Savior, as their Master, they burned all their old ways. They burned all their magic art books publicly. You know, these Christians in Ephesus, they, don't, they, they did not hold a garage sale and sell all those expensive books and give the money to the church. They didn't do that. These Christians, they did not give their precious and costly books away to someone else to use. No, they burned it. They realized it was evil. Evil for them, evil for anyone else. They burned it so that they, could, so that they would not go and could not go back to it. They made a public, personal, passionate, purposeful declaration that they would serve only Jesus and nothing else. And did you see in verse 20? So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. You see, when the believers, when they heard the word of God, and when they lived it out, and obediently practiced it outside, publicly, and burned their junk, that's when the word of God increased and prevailed mightily. You see what's lacking in so many churches today? We hear God's word. We are challenged. We make promises inside. But we don't live it outside. We don't live it outside. We don't obey God's word outside and also inside. The word of God is not increasing and prevailing mightily among us. Because we are not burning up our junk. We are not giving up our idols. We are holding on to them. And we are saying also, yes, we will serve God. 
as we are still worshipping and enslaved to our own idols. I said this last Sunday, anything or anyone that takes the place of God in our lives, anything or anyone that we crave, that we want, that we enjoy, that we treasure more than God, is an idol. It can be things, it can be people, it can be our own family members. And so the people standing in front of Joshua, they were also doing the same. They were promising to serve God while they were also serving other idols. Joshua told them, put away your gods. Then serve God, the Lord. Now you remember the place where they were. Joshua had specifically called them to Shechem. Now I told you two Sundays back, in Genesis chapter 35, when Jacob, when he returned back from serving his father-in-law in Haran, and where he got married and all of that, when he came back, when he came back, he settled in Shechem. And it was in Shechem that Jacob purified his house from the foreign gods. His family had brought them, those foreign gods from Haran. And, Josh, and, and Jacob purified his house from those foreign gods that, is, that his family had brought with them. In Genesis 35 verse 4, Jacob, he buried those idols, all those idols under the terebinth tree. And when Joshua says this to the people, he must have expected his people to also bring out their idols and to destroy them like their forefather Jacob had done in this same place years back. But these people did not. They were only saying the right words, we will also serve the Lord when they were also serving other gods. And so Joshua says in verses 19 and 20, Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. You are not able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. You see, Joshua is so bold and courageous as the leader to say this to, the, to his people's face. He says it to them right in front of them. And this is the whole Israel. And the people could have said, how dare you say that to us? And they could have mobbed and killed him. But Joshua is not scared of that. He's an old man of 110. And he's still bold to say this, the truth in front of his people. You know, if any pastor would dare to say this in the church, you are not able to serve the Lord. If any pastor would dare to say this in the church, he'd probably kick that pastor out. But see, Joshua is not driving the people away from God. He, he is actually shocking them to realize their condition, their sinful condition, so that they can repent and return to God. See, here's the thing. Why, why is Joshua doing this? Because Joshua has seen this before. You remember when the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, and when they came to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, when Moses set before them, the elders and the people, all the words that the Lord had commanded him. In Exodus 19 verse 8, all the people, they answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Everyone said it together. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. But just a few weeks later, the same people, they were worshipping a golden calf. Joshua had seen that. And he knew that it was very easy for the people to just 
say words and promise obedience to God. But it was quite something else for them to actually do it. My dear brothers and sisters, we cannot say one thing and do something else. We cannot make a, we cannot make a deal with God. We cannot make a deal with the living God. I will serve you. But I'm also going to keep my idols. Please understand this. And I say this lovingly. God, our God, is not a sweet, cuddly little teddy bear who will say to us, Oh, you want to keep your idols and also follow me? That's okay. I love you anyway. You do whatever you want. You live however you want. I will love you anyway. Our God is not a sweet, cuddly little teddy bear to say like that. No. Our God, the only God, is a holy God. He is a jealous God. And he will not go on forgiving our rebellion. If we forsake God, and if we deliberately, willfully choose to serve idols, God will not tolerate that. How many of us, how many of us husbands and wives will keep on loving our spouses if they are continuing to cheat on us and they are being unfaithful to us with other men and women? How many of us husbands and wives will continue to love our spouses if they are doing that, if they are cheating on us? We cannot tolerate that as humans, right? Then how can Jesus accept that kind of unfaithfulness from his bride, from his church. So listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, when everything was going great for Jesus, crowds, great crowds were following Jesus. That's when Jesus stops and when he specifically says something. He specifically says, who cannot be? His disciple. And so my dear brothers and sisters. Please listen closely to what Jesus is saying. And check whether you are a disciple or not. Because this is what Jesus says. Who cannot be his disciple. Please listen. Josh, uh, Luke chapter 14. Now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned and said to them. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Not my words. Jesus' words. Who cannot be Jesus' disciples? What Jesus is saying is this. We should love Jesus so much that our love, and Jesus doesn't tell us not to love our family. No, he tells us to love. Husbands are told to love their wives as Jesus loved the church. No, he's not telling people not to love. No, but our love for Jesus should be so much that our love for our parents, our love for our spouse, our love for our children, our love for our siblings, in comparison, should seem like hatred. John MacArthur writes, Jesus was calling his disciples to cultivate a devotion to him that their attachment to everything else, including their own lives, would seem like hatred by comparison. If you love your parents, if you love your spouse, if you love your children, if you love your siblings, if you love your country, if you love anything else, if you love your own life more than you love Jesus, you cannot be his disciple. Not my words, his words. Jesus says, Luke 14, 27, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
What does it mean to bear your, to bear your own cross, to carry your own cross? Listen to what uh, Warren B.S.B. writes. He writes, it means daily identification with Christ in shame, suffering, and surrender to God's will. It means death to self, death to our own plans and ambitions, and a willingness to serve him as he directs. A cross is something that we willingly accept from God as part of his will for our lives. Now, if you think that your cross is a noisy neighbor, if you think that your cross is the financial burden and pressure that you're facing, that's not a cross. Christians and non-Christians have bad neighbors and sickness and illness and financial pressures and more. They are not the cross that we need to bear that Jesus is talking about. No. If I, me, myself, my rights, my will is more important to us than God's will, if we cannot deny ourselves, if we cannot die to ourselves and our plans and our will every day, if we cannot die to that, we cannot be a disciple of Jesus. Not my words, his words. Verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. If we cannot carefully assess, and that's what those verses that I have skipped over there, that's what they talk about. If we cannot carefully assess and count the cost, if we cannot willingly give up everything for Jesus and have Jesus as our greatest treasure, we cannot be a disciple of Jesus. Not my words. His words. It's a total commitment on nothing. You give everything or nothing at all. See, my dear brothers and sisters, the world and many churches, they very wrongly portray Jesus and they see Jesus as love, love, love. Jesus makes it very clear who cannot be his disciple. He makes it very clear. And so you know that there are many people who say, oh, I hate the church. I hate Christians. I love Jesus. Show them this passage. And tell them this is what Jesus demands. Are you up for it? My dear brothers and sisters, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? You know, the dictionary definition of a fan is an enthusiastic or ardent admirer. Are you an enthusiastic or an ardent admirer of Jesus? Or are you a follower, a disciple of Jesus? Jesus is not interested in enthusiastic and ardent admirers. That's why he told the crowd, he, he had great crowds. He's not interested in that. He demands committed followers and disciples. Jesus wants more from us than just a hand raised or a prayer repeated at the end of a service. Jesus is looking for more than a prayer before a meal. Jesus is looking for more than just a Jesus fish on the back of our car. Jesus doesn't want fans. Jesus wants disciples who will deny themselves, take up their cross daily, die to themselves and follow him. If we are a Christian with Jesus first, if we are a Christian without the character of Jesus growing in us, if we are a Christian for whom the word of God is not very important, and this was very important for Jesus, so if we are a Christian for whom this is not important, 
if we are a Christian and we are not devoted to Jesus and his demands, then we are worthless like salt that has lost its saltiness. That's what it says. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can it, how shall it, its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. If we are salt that has lost its saltiness, if we do not have Christ in us, if we do not, if we are not keeping his demands on us as his disciples, if you are not obedient, if you are not keeping his word, then we are like salt that has lost its saltiness. And if you, are a, if you are like salt that has lost its saltiness, we are a witness against ourselves. And that's the same thing that, you know, Joshua is basically saying to the people. He says, you know, when the people keep saying, no, we will serve the Lord, then Joshua says, you are a witness against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they say, no, we are witnesses. We are witnesses. Let's, let's close here and let's, let's bow down our heads and let's think about ourselves. You know, you know in your own hearts whether you have idols. Anything or anyone that you crave for, that you desire, that you want, that you cling to, that you love more than God is an idol. You and I, we know what are our idols. Are you willing to give that all up are you willing to be a disciple of Jesus? You cannot mix allegiance. You have to make a firm choice. Would you take this time? Say a prayer in your own heart. Most gracious Lord, we thank you for the mirror of your word that shows us exactly where we are, what is wrong in our lives. And we thank you, dear God, that you are a God who is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You can, Lord, we know that you hate, you hate us serving other idols, and you can wipe us off for doing that. But we thank you that you are merciful and gracious. And that you give us another chance, another opportunity to willingly choose to love you and serve you. And we pray, dear God, that just as your word has convicted and challenged us that you'd help us to make a choice for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you weren't interested in the crowds, but you were interested in committed disciples, not fans, but followers, true followers. And so help us, Lord Jesus, that we'll be obedient to you and that we would be your true disciples. Forgive us and help us, strengthen us to live as your loving, obedient children and disciples. We give ourselves into your hands. Thank you, Lord, for listening. In Jesus' most precious name we ask and we pray. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. We thank you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are, you are everlasting, you are eternal. You are the same God whom Moses and Joshua worshipped. You are the same God with those same demands to love you and to serve you as you had for Moses, the people whom Moses and Joshua led. 
we thank you that you are the same unchanging God. And Lord, we pray that we would be your children. Help us, O Master. Help us to truly worship you, not just within the four walls of this building, but help us to show, Lord, in our worship of you, in our Christian life, that we love you, that we serve you to the people outside. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again for uniting us and for helping us to worship you, our maker and our creator. Thank you, O God, that you've given us enough that we can give, O Lord, out of the bountiful that you've blessed us with to your church. And so bless and receive these offerings, O Master, that we have given unto you. Bless them and use them for the extension of your kingdom. And bless us also, dear God, as your children, as your people, to live lives that show that we, that we love you and that you are first for us. Thank you again for listening. For we ask all of this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Receive the benediction in faith, and now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful week ahead. God bless.